Hello and welcome to a three-part video series on getting started with Remedy Force Service Level Management. My name is John Layton and I'm part of our Remedy Force Customer Success team here at BMC Software. To learn more about our Remedy Force Customer Success program, you can reach out to us at remedyforcesuccess at bmc.com. That's remedyforcesuccess, or one word, at bmc.com. In this first part, we'll talk about some of the preparation and planning required to successfully implement service level management in your organisation. In part two, we'll take a closer look at how to set up service level agreements and associated service level targets within Remedy Force. And in part three, we'll focus on how to report across your service level success and performance. When we think about service level management, we're inevitably drawn to focus on response and resolution targets. However, it's important to remain aware of the wider activities involved in service level management. From an ITIL perspective, Service level management sits within the service design stage and has close ties to service catalogue, capacity, availability, service continuity, information security and supplier management. Overall, the service level management activities aim to build and maintain relationships with the business, with internal functional groups and with suppliers. Many of us are familiar with the concept of service level agreements between a service provider and their customer. For many of our customers, we consider that the agreement between IT and the business. Operating level agreements tend to focus on the agreements between the functional IT teams. For example, we may have an OLE in place with our service desk, stating that all incidents unresolved after 30 minutes of logging must be escalated to the appropriate support group. In this way, OLAs can act as a leading indicator of expected SLA performance. Similarly, underpinning contracts are the agreements in place between IT and the various suppliers that enable us to meet the overall SLA target. For example, a hardware maintenance agreement that guarantees a laptop swap within 24 hours. Let's look at some of the other areas to consider when planning to implement service level management within your organisation. From a people perspective, consider how we define and document the roles and responsibilities associated to service level management. Our organisation may not be of a scale to employ a specific service level manager However, it is important that we understand what the role entails and who is best placed to perform this role in addition to their existing duties. Alongside the service level manager role, we often see roles such as business relationship manager or business analyst involved in the SLM process. Consider who are our contacts within the business. Who are our business process owners and what do we need from them in order to build solid shared understanding and strong relationships? From a communications perspective, how often do we plan to meet with our business owners, internal IT groups and our suppliers? Is this meeting in person? Is this meeting over teleconferences? What's our agenda? What do we hope to achieve? What are those that we're meeting with hope to gain from the interaction? How does the feedback from these groups form part of our continuous service improvement initiatives? How do we present service level management data back to these stakeholders? What's the format? What's the frequency? These are all key questions that we should be asking ourselves as we plan to implement service level management. OK, let's get a little more tactical for a moment. For those just starting out on their SLM journey, it's important to start simply and evolve to a more complex SLM environment as the needs of your business require it. We have to consider which process areas we plan to start with. For most of our customers, incident management or break fix is a great starting point. This is the area where we can tangibly measure those response and resolution targets of our IT teams. By its nature, incident management reflects disruption to a business service or team, and for most folks involved in keeping the lights on, resolving incidents and restoring service is a key operational activity. Some customers also choose to implement SLA targets based on standardized service requests. In these cases, expected delivery timeframes should be established in advance as part of the service request and service catalogue activity, avoiding those situations where a customer requests a service for tomorrow that we know takes three days to fulfil. With service requests, specific SLAs tend to be created against specific criteria associated to the request, such as the category or the service offering. Back to incident management. Within Remedy Force, we have an out-of-the-box ability to track due date against a priority. We do consider this the most basic of measures, as really this tracks the duration of the incident from creation to closure. And unlike our true service level management capability, this does not give you an ability to pause the SLA clock for situations where perhaps you're waiting for a customer to respond to you. Regardless of this limitation, if we're not measuring any incident management performance metrics today, other than perhaps volumetric-based reporting, 
this may be an appropriate starting point for us. You can see that by default, we present both the due date and a due date process indicator on the Remedy Force console. To view or to edit the default due date associated with priorities, go to the Remedy Force Administration tab, select Configure Application, and choose Priority. Here you can see the pre-configured priorities based on impact and urgency settings and the associated durations. By clicking on the priority number, you can edit to adjust the default duration and or the impact urgency criteria. Irrespective of whether you choose to start with this basic duration due date measure or a more robust service level agreement, it is essential that you have spent some time ensuring that the way you prioritise incidents is accurate and aligned to your business. Incorrectly prioritising too many incidents as P1s with aggressive response and resolution targets is a surefire way to miss your target. For more information about the role of priority, impact and urgency, you can take a look at our Remedy Force white papers on the BMC community site. Okay, so once we've determined that we need to introduce full-blown SLA metrics, again, we need to consider the criteria we plan to use to determine response and resolution targets. In keeping it simple, customers typically continue to use priority as the key criteria for SLAs. For those customers with more complex SLM needs, a variety of criteria can be used to determine service targets alongside priority, such as category or business service, or additional custom fields that reflect your business. Earlier, we talked about having an ability to stop the SLA clock where appropriate. As part of our service level planning, we need to determine which incident statuses will result in both the stopping and starting of the SLA clock. Equally, we need to consider what type of notifications we need to send to assigned IT staff and IT management to advise them of imminent target breaches. Again, our recommendation is to start simple and not to introduce too many notifications on day one. There's always a danger that too many solution generated notifications may be viewed as spam and ignored. We'll get hands on and cover aspects of SLA clock stopping and target actions in part two of this series. Let's cover some closing points as we wrap up part one of this service level management video series. I've worked with a number of customers who have expressed concern about measuring SLAs as they feel that they're not yet ready to have those discussions with their business. My response is always to encourage the baseline use of SLAs for internal benchmarking sometime before we begin a conversation with the business about service level management. We really want to go into that first service level management discussion with a good set of data showing current performance levels based on business orientated prioritization of incidents. We want that baseline data to reflect current resourcing levels and ideally to span a reasonable business cycle so as to capture peak utilization. As a minimum, a full month's baseline is important to see us through a month-end business cycle. However, ideally, that baseline data would be gathered over a three to six month period. Once we have that baseline data and are ready to start discussing service level management with our business, it's important that we listen carefully during those early discussions and try to determine whether there are any quick wins we can gain to improve the services we provide. Be prepared to swiftly solve areas of discontent that will go a long way to building credibility in our SLM program and will demonstrate the value to our business process owners of fully participating in these discussions. Finally, remember that every opportunity to interact with your business and customers is a great opportunity to drive engagement and to market the services and the value that your team provides. With a core part of an overall SLM strategy to be regular reviews with business process owners, this really is an excellent opportunity to gain candid feedback as to where IT services are succeeding and where they are falling short. I hope you'll join me again for part two of this series as we get hands-on with Remedy Force and begin building out some example SLAs. Thank you.